Welcome back to another serving of Digital Camera Nostalgia and today we're partying like it's 1999 by revisiting the legendary Nikon D1, the first DSLR that Nikon designed and built entirely by themselves. Now the D1 was by no means the first digital SLR on the market. Kodak had been modifying Nikon film SLRs with their own electronics since the late 80s and gradually evolving to the DCS 400 series in the mid 90s based on F90 or N90 bodies. Their flagship model at this time was the DCS 460 boasting an industry leading 6.2 megapixel sensor with an impressively mild 1.3 times crop but with an eye-wateringly expensive price tag of $35,600 when it was launched in 1995. In the same year, Nikon launched another DSLR collaboration, this time with Fujifilm providing most of the electronics. The E2 series was more affordable than the Kodaks thanks to a much smaller 2 3rd inch sensor, while additional cunning optics in the body allowed lenses to actually deliver the same field of view as they would when fitted on 35mm film cameras with no crop factor. However, the combination of a smaller sensor and those conversion optics did impact the overall quality. So while the E2 did spawn a handful of successors, Nikon's management decided in 1996 to begin development of their own DSLR in-house with performance to satisfy professionals, but at a more affordable price than those Kodak DCS models. The project also included development of a consumer model, the Coolpix 900, to refine some of the technologies. The 900 launched in 1998 and I have a video all about it if you're interested, while the D1 was announced a year later in September 1999 at the relatively bargain price of $5,500, although most of us didn't actually get our hands on it until the following year. And here it is, aged 23 years, so let's see how the D1 looks, feels and performs over two decades after it was first announced. Nikon wisely deployed everything it knew about SLR ergonomics into the D1, basing the body design on the F100 and in particular the F5, resulting in a comfortable, tough and crucially a very familiar experience. Back then, anyone who knew Nikon's film SLRs could get to work straight away with the D1 and two decades later almost everything still remains very recognisable. As a pro body, it has a built-in portrait grip with the duplicate shutter and thumb dial making it comfortable to shoot in either orientation. On the top, there's a rotary power collar around a soft touch shutter release with a twist to briefly illuminate the top and rear information displays. Holding the mode button while turning the thumb dial cycles between the four PASM modes. No need for anything else here, while the front finger and thumb dials provide satisfyingly tactile exposure adjustments. A lockable control on the side of the viewfinder head switches between the three metering modes, while on the upper left side of the body is the main operating dial with the usual single, continuous and self-timer drive modes, along with PC and play positions, the latter thankfully reassigned to a simpler button on later models. Meanwhile, three chunky buttons on the top allow you to adjust the bracketing, flash and focus area modes by pushing and then turning either the finger or thumb dials. Around the back you'll find a slightly spongy four-way controller used to select between the five auto focusing areas or for navigation within the menus and in playback. Now you already know that for playback you'll need to turn a dial on the top of the camera but in order to enter the menus you'll first need to flip down the panel on the back that's alongside the secondary information screen and that's where you'll find five buttons which also provide direct access to the quality, sensitivity, white balance and custom menus. As a DSLR before the days of live view, the D1 relied entirely on its optical viewfinder for composition and here I filmed it with the AF 35mm f2D lens fitted. You can see the five autofocusing areas along with shooting information running below including the metering mode, the shutter, aperture, exposure mode and the remaining shots in the buffer. The mechanical shutter speed ran between 30 seconds and an impressively fast 16 thousandth of a second and that's typically double what you get from most mechanical shutters on pro bodies today. Oh and as a professional DSLR the viewfinder also included a curtain to prevent light leaks. In the absence of live view which didn't arrive on a Nikon DSLR until the D300 in 2007 the D1 screen was limited to menu and playback duties. The two inch size was fairly generous in the day, although the panel resolution of just 120K dots means the display and text can often look a little coarse. In terms of connectivity, there's a PC sync port and remote terminal on the front, above a composite video output and DC input behind the flap. 
while behind its own flap on the rear of the body is a 1394 Firewire port for high-speed data. For power, the D1 used a substantial EN4 nickel metal hydrid pack which slotted directly into the body, including its own dial to lock it in place. The battery even included a socket for direct connection to the supplied AC charger, although sadly that plug was different to the one on the front of the body, which forced you to buy another AC adapter if you wanted to operate the D1 on mains power. Sadly, the battery supplied with this particular D1 refused to accept any more charge, but thankfully third-party replacements are still available for around 20 bucks. That will also work. Just search for EN4 replacement. Here's one that came with a used D1X body that I bought for just £50 from eBay. That works fine on the D1, allowing me to bring it back to life again. As for memory, the D1 offered a single compact flash slot that supported thicker Type 2 cards, although some people did report issues when using the IBM Microdrive at the time. The button to open the card hatch was hidden behind its own little mini door, which prevented accidental access. Which finally brings me to the heart of the D1, its CCD imaging sensor sporting 2.7 megapixels and an APS-C area that reduced the field of view of all lenses by 1.5 times. In a fascinating 2008 interview with the general manager of Nikon's imaging company, it was revealed that the D1 sensor actually had 10.8 megapixels, but they were grouped into fours on the D1 for greater sensitivity and dynamic range. The D1 sensor alone took several years to develop, with Nikon initially struggling to find a manufacturer that actually believed such a product would sell in sufficient quantities to make it worthwhile, and later having to adapt the wiring so that the hungry component could even work under battery power. These were serious challenges at the time. Then there was the colour processing inherited from earlier video cameras and based on the NTSC television standard. This in turn resulted in owners quickly having to learn about colour profiles and how to correct unwanted casts, with the D1 images often looking a little magenta out of camera. Now don't get me wrong, the D1 didn't actually officially use the NTSC colour space, but having been calibrated by the engineers on NTSC monitors, many owners found that the actual NTSC profile was the best starting point when processing their images. I'll show you some sample images in just a moment, but briefly, for now, here's the D1 at each of its four sensitivities, starting at the base of 200 ISO and ending at a maximum of 1600 ISO. As for burst, the D1 could shoot up to 4.5 frames per second, with a buffer good for around 20 best quality JPEGs, groundbreakingly fast at the time, and here's how that glorious shutter still sounds. As for optics, the D1 was compatible with almost any F-mount lens, and that provided access to a wealth of options, all having a 1.5 times crop applied by that APS-C sensor. But which lens should I use to test the D1 today? I fancied something with an approximately standard field of view, which meant using one of the many 35mm lenses that are available. I narrowed it down to two choices, the AF35 F2D on the left and the newer AFX35 1.8 DX on the right, and I've actually made a separate video comparing them directly against each other on the D1 and D1X, but I'll cut to the chase right now and let you know that I opted for the older F2D model for my test, which felt like a classier and more age-appropriate option. So without further ado, here's a selection of photos that I took with the Nikon D1 around Brighton 23 years after it was first launched. All JPEGs straight out of camera and none of them colour corrected, so do expect that magenta cast. And mercifully, there's no video clips as it was several years before DSLRs could even manage that particular trick. I'll see you in just a moment.
The Nikon D1 was without a doubt a triumph, a groundbreakingly professional DSLR built from the ground up by a single company. The $5,500 price tag not only significantly undercut Kodak's dominant DCS series, but actually redefined what we could expect from a pro DSLR in terms of performance. Kodak responded by cutting prices, but it was already too late with the D1 quickly gathering momentum. And along with Canon's D30, launched a year later, toppling the leader from its throne. In the mid to late 90s, Kodak may have been the undisputed king of professional DSLRs, but in the early 2000s, the tide had changed. Two decades on, the D1's image quality and color science unsurprisingly looks a little dated, and there's a few control choices that do remain questionable. But shooting with it today, I was really struck how good it still felt and how quickly I could get to grips with it. Returning to many vintage cameras of this period often means grappling with weird controls and even stranger menu systems. But the D1 is part of a very well honed series looking and feeling like pro Nikon bodies both before and long after. Now there's always a few new things to learn with every model that you pick up, but the D1 deployed Nikon's heritage in ergonomics and design to become an instant classic. This is the camera that started the modern era of digital SLRs, driven by the major camera brands and dominating the professional market for over two decades before mirrorless became significantly mature to provide a viable alternative at the high end. And the best part for collectors who could only dream of owning a $5,500 camera in 1999 is being able to pick up one of these bad boys in working condition for less than 100 bucks today. In fact, I found its success to the D1X with a working battery and charger for just 50 pounds. That is a pretty good bargain. So were you shooting with pro DSLRs in the 90s and early 2000s? I'd love to hear from your memories in the comments and in particular, what you loved about these kinds of cameras and also what you found the most frustrating. If you enjoy these vintage camera reviews, do check out some of my other videos and I'd love it if you considered subscribing to help this channel grow. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.